Hi, my name is Diane Vance of the Chemistry Department at Eastern Kentucky University. Today I'm going to be demonstrating for you the experiment titration of an unknown acid. The experiment today is a demonstration of a type of chemistry called quantitative analysis, which is that branch of chemistry that tries to determine how much of a given material is in a mixture or a substance. This is a very important branch of chemistry and one of the most important determinations that is frequently made is the amount of acid or base in a given material. There are a lot of techniques that you can use to determine the amount of acid or base, but one of the most common techniques is what's called a titration. You have learned something in lecture about what a titration is. The basic idea is that you have an unknown substance and a known substance. You take the known substance and you add a measured amount of the known substance until it completely reacts with the unknown. At that point, you stop the reaction, and then you can do a calculation to let you determine the amount of unknown from the amount of known that you used to complete the reaction. In an acid-base titration, an indicator is a substance that shows you when you have reached the end point or the end of the titration. The indicator usually is a substance that changes color, and that's what will happen in the reaction today. In this experiment, your unknown is going to be vinegar, and you're going to be trying to determine the amount of acid that's in that vinegar sample. The equipment that you'll use today, for the most part, is already familiar to you. You'll need a beaker. You'll need a squirt bottle with distilled water. You will need a flask that you haven't used before called an Erlenmeyer flask. And as we proceed with the titration, you'll see why we've chosen to use this instead of a beaker. It's much easier to prevent splashing when we do the titration with an Erlenmeyer flask. You also will need a ring stand, which you've used before. And two items that are new to you will be a burette and the clamp for the burette. I need to talk a little bit about the burette before you begin to use it today. This part is the body of the burette, and this part down here is called a stopcock. You can see that this stopcock has a handle on it that can be turned. And if I turn the handle, liquid will flow out. If I turn the handle back so that it is uh, perpendicular to the barrel, then that closes off the flow of liquid. A burette is calibrated, in this case, from 0 milliliters down to 25 milliliters. And probably the newest thing for you will be to make sure that you read the burette properly. First of all, you read down from the top. The burette is marked in whole milliliter increments, so it's very easy to tell whether you're at 0 milliliters or 1 or 2 milliliters. The burette also is marked in tenths of a milliliter. So it is, again, definitely easy to tell whether you have two tenths or three tenths or five tenths. You can estimate one more decimal place after the markings on the burette, which means that you can, in this case, estimate the reading on the burette to the hundredths place. You've used a graduated cylinder before, so you know that when you put water into a tube like this, the water surface curves and makes what's called a meniscus. And you have to remember always to read the bottom of the meniscus when you read the burette. So on a burette, always have two decimal places when you record your answer. The burette clamp is new to you, but not difficult to use. You simply squeeze together these two pieces, and that brings the uh, holders apart. You can then put the tube of the burette there and gently let those two parts go, and the burette will be securely clamped for use in the experiment. To begin the experiment, the first thing you need to do is make sure that the burette is clean and rinsed. You will first of all add to the burette about five milliliters of water. I've already added some water to this burette. When you rinse a burette, you don't need to fill it all the way to the top with the material that you're rinsing with. You can just put some material in there, turn the burette on its side, 
and gently rotate the burette so that the liquid that you're rinsing with contacts all the surfaces. You can let this rinse and the succeeding rinses go into the sink. Now I'm saving a little bit of rinse because I also want to rinse the lower part of the burette. And to do that, I'm simply going to open the stopcock and allow the rest of this rinse to flow through. So this is the first rinse you do is with distilled water. The second rinse you do is with the solution that you're going to use in the titration. In this titration, you're going to use sodium hydroxide that has a known concentration in order to do the titration. There will be a large container of sodium hydroxide available in the lab. You can use your beaker, go back and get some of the sodium hydroxide, which I've already done in this beaker. You then want to rinse the burette with the sodium hydroxide that you're going to use in the experiment. So again, making sure that the stopcock is closed, you can add about five milliliters. It doesn't really matter how much. Turn the burette, rotate it so that the solution contacts all the interior surfaces of the burette. You can let some run out the end, but save a little bit. Turn the burette up vertically, open the stopcock, and let the sodium hydroxide run out through the tip so that that part also gets rinsed. After you've rinsed the burette once with sodium hydroxide, repeat the rinse. What this rinse does is to try to ensure that there's no droplets of water that might change the concentration of your sodium hydroxide. We complete the rinse by letting the sodium hydroxide run out through the stopcock. And we make sure that the burette is empty. The next thing that we'll do is get the burette ready for the actual analysis. To do this, we'll add sodium hydroxide to the burette. And we will add enough sodium hydroxide so that the sodium hydroxide goes above the zero mark on the burette. Here's the sodium hydroxide, and here's the zero mark on the burette. We'll then let some sodium hydroxide run out until it's below the zero mark. That way, we'll be able to get an initial reading on the burette. The other thing we want to watch out for when we're running out the sodium hydroxide is that the sodium hydroxide runs out cleanly through the tip and that there are no air bubbles in the tip. Once you have done those two things, you can return the burette to the clamp and leave it there while we get the sample for the next part of the experiment. The Erlenmeyer flask is what's going to hold the vinegar sample that we're going to titrate. Uh, the flask should be dry on the outside, and it probably will already be clean when you start, but it's a good idea to do a couple of rinses with distilled water first. So we'll rinse the inside of the flask with distilled water and discard the water. Do a second rinse and discard the water. The flask does not have to be dry on the inside because you're going to add water to this anyway a little bit later. After you've rinsed the Erlenmeyer flask, you then want to get the weight of the flask. So as you've done before, you use the balance, zero the balance, place the Erlenmeyer flask on the balance, and record the weight of the flask, and make sure that you record three decimal places when you get the weight of the flask. After you've recorded the weight of the balance, you then will go and get your vinegar sample. When you came into the lab, the instructor should have assigned you a letter for an unknown vinegar. You want to find that letter of the unknown vinegar, and you want to obtain some of that vinegar. You've used these dispensing devices before. You know that in order to dispense this material, you simply raise up the top, and you don't want to pull the top off and then push down all the way, and a small volume of vinegar will be ejected into your flask. Once you've obtained the vinegar sample, you then want to go back to the balance, zero the balance, reweigh the flask, and record that weight. This will let you know the weight of vinegar that you are starting the experiment with. 
after you have uh, gotten your vinegar sample and weighed the flask, this is a step you want to be sure to do because it's easy to forget and if you forget it, uh, you'll never get to the end point of the experiment. The indicator for this experiment is called phenothaline and you have to add the phenothaline to your flask in order to get the color change. So get the phenothaline indicator and add two to four drops of that indicator to your flask. Once you've added indicator to the flask, we then are going to add some water to the flask, about 30 milliliters. And as I'm doing this, I'm rinsing down the sides of the flask just in case any of the vinegar happened to splash up on the sides. The amount of water that you add at the start is not important. You don't want to fill up the flask, but uh, you do want some additional volume in the bottom of the flask. We're then going to come back over to the burette that has the sodium hydroxide in it. You'll notice that we've got a white piece of paper here because the end point that we're looking for is a change to a very pale pink color and it's much easier to see against a white background. The first thing we need to do is make sure that our burette is ready to go. We already should have lowered the volume of the sodium hydroxide so that it's below the zero mark and we should be sure that there are no air bubbles in the tip. If that's not true, you can put a little more sodium hydroxide out to clear out any of these air bubbles. Once you've done that, be sure that you record the volume that you start with on the burette. This is your initial reading. And remember that you will read it to two decimal places. The reading here, for example, is probably approximately 0 0.85. Don't forget to record your initial reading. Once you've recorded the initial reading and you've prepared the sample, you can then begin the process of titration. And what you need to do is uh, admit the sodium hydroxide with the stopcock with one hand and use the other hand to swirl the solution. Now at first you'll be able to add the sodium hydroxide pretty quickly. You'll see when you add the sodium hydroxide that you get a little bit of a pink color but as you swirl the flask, the pink color goes away. The more and more sodium hydroxide you add, the slower the pink color will go away. Now eventually, you'll reach a point where the pink color, despite the swirling, stays. At this point, you've reached the end point of the titration. This means that you've added an equivalent amount of sodium hydroxide to the amount of vinegar or acid that's in the flask. Uh, the end point is a very pale pink color. After you've reached the end point of the reaction, you want to make sure that you read the final volume on the burette, again remembering to read to two decimal places. After you've done one titration, you can dispose of the solution in the sink, rinse the flask, and then perform another titration in exactly the same way as we did this one. After you have performed two trials, then you want to go ahead and do your calculations. When you do the calculations, the final result, which will be the percent of acid in the vinegar, must agree to within the required relative average deviation. If the agreement is not within this required amount, then you will have to do a third titration so that you can get to the required agreement. To do the calculations for this experiment, we'll first of all start with the assumption that we make when we do a titration. And that assumption is that at the end point of the titration, the number of moles of base that you've added, which you know, will be equal to the number of moles of acid which are present, which you don't know. We symbolize number of moles with the small n. So I've shortened this and said, Na equals Nb, or number of moles of acid equal number of moles of base. In order to calculate the number of moles of base, you simply have to take the volume of base in milliliters multiplied by the molarity of base, which you will know because it will be on the bottle of base that you have in the lab, and we're dividing by a thousand so that we can convert milliliters to liters.
This will tell you the number of moles of base that you added to get to the end point of the titration. To determine the weight of the acid, you simply will take the number of moles of acid, which remember is equal to the number of moles of base that you've just calculated, and multiply by 60.01. 60.01 is the molecular weight of acetic acid, which is the acid that's in vinegar. This will tell you the weight of acid in grams. And then a calculation that you're familiar with is to determine the percent of acid in the sample. To do that, you take the weight of the acid in grams divided by the weight of the vinegar that you took when you first got your sample and multiply it by 100. This will give you the percent acid in the sample, and it's these numbers that you should be comparing to calculate the relative average deviation. After you have completed the calculations and you've met the required relative average deviation, you can then clean up. Uh, all of the solutions that you've used today can be disposed of down the drain. Make sure that you rinse the burette and the flask well with distilled water when you're finished.